attention, all residents of Elwood City. This is an emergency broadcast. Okay, just kidding. It's Lucas here, your buddy, your pal. Uh, I'm just here to remind you that if you want to help us out here at Elwood City Limits, uh, there's a couple of ways. Of course, there's, you know, donating to the Patreon. But another huge way that helps us is uh, nominating us for the Coast Best of Halifax Award. See, Elwood City Limits is a Halifax podcast, and one of the ways that we get recognition is in the annual Coast Awards. Last year, we were nominated, and we'd love to be nominated again. It's really simple. All you have to do is go to bestofhalifax.com, scroll down to the News and Media section, and then under Podcast, write down Elwood City Limits. And that supports us here as a podcast. Okay, that, that that's the end of the emergency broadcast. So I don't know if anybody's really going to notice this, but uh, th- th- this is a this is a podcast first. This is an Elwood City Limits first. Um, we're recording on a completely different platform tonight. Yeah, there's a real ghost in the machine between my computer starting and and technical issues and traffic getting home. It's been quite the journey to uh, bring you, dear listener, this episode of Elwood City Limits this evening. But hey, we're like the mail. Nor rain, nor snow, nor broken Skype. Uh, we got to bring you the Arthur commentary you crave. Yeah, I wonder if maybe we could like do something with this with our um, with our like Patreon thing, <laughs> our, pa- our 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 private Discord ser- Patreon server. Pimping the Discord up front, might as well. That's right. If you want to, you know talk to us like this you can uh, hop on the old discord yeah i mean we'll ha- we, d- we should probably talk about this off the air i suppose but like ima- w- is it is there such a thing like that we'd be able to do to like invite everybody in our patreon to like a you know a, like a, to be essentially the studio audience in the chat oh my god <laughs> interesting <laughs> that, it's it's something to consider i suppose well, I'm going to have to ask maybe somebody on our Patreon who is a lot more familiar uh, with this sort of technology than we are. Welcome, everybody, to Elwood City Limits, broadcasting live from Discord. This is uh, Will Young, and that's Lucas Mancini. Hello! I'm finally here, after much ado. <laughs> Worth waiting for, for sure. Um, yeah, it's a little bit of a rainy Thursday night, and we're ready to talk about uh, more Arthur. Um and yeah, it's going to be a little bit of a new ex- new experience uh, for us. I mean, I I remember you know saying when we started the Patreon, just like yeah, we're gonna like uh, have all of these you know we'll be able to play games with you online and stuff. And then that never really happened because I realized that I don't really play a lot of online games. I know that you have been known to dabble, Lucas. That's right. I still. You know, play a game of Apex Legends here or there when I get the uh, get the inkling. Um, but I've my PlayStation Plus has uh, lapsed a long time ago because I didn't have a job really. I've been in school, but mm. maybe that'll change and I'll get back into the Overwatch groove of things. Who knows? Well, I just recently let my uh, PSN my PS Plus membership go because I wanted to sign up for another subscription service, and it turns out this is the best month to do it because the newest one is like Football Manager and a PS4 port of a mobile game. So I feel very vindicated in making my decision. Now, well, you know, normally I wouldn't care about this. I'd let you off scot free, but uh, it seemed like you were very tactful in not listing what the subscription service was. And so I have to, for the curiosity of the literacy and my own curiosity, uh, what was the new subscription service that you decided to cancel PlayStation Plus for? So if you, uh, if you follow me on Twitter, it's at William Y. Will Y U M W H Y. Well, you'll know that I've been watching a lot more of professional wrestling <gasps> organization Chikara lately. Oh, interesting. So, Chikara Topia. I got it uh, earlier this month, and it's been great fun. It's been it's been awesome. I used to follow for those for the many I'm sure who aren't aware. Chikara is an independent 
professional wrestling organization that's kind of meant to be a bit more family friendly. It, it, it embraces the more colorful side of professional wrestling. There's a lot of masked wrestlers with outrageous comic book type gimmicks. Uh, there's a lot of uh, very good, clean fun along the way. I don't know. It's It also has, like co- like I mentioned comic books before, it's got a lot of overarching storylines with, like, you know, ev- like evil bad guys and heroic good guys. It's kind of, it's it's a nice little bit of a brainwash. For, uh, oh, <laughs> wrong word, I guess. A, uh, a brain scrub from the, uh, you know, wrestling that's on TV right now, which is quite bad. Well, Will, I actually uh, started subscribing to a wrestling subscription service as well. Oh. Uh, but don't worry. It's not as exciting or good or clean as yours. I resubscribed to my uh, long-time lapsed Wrestling Observer subscription. Uh, okay. Because the messiness on Twitter, uh, uh, <laughs> I, I'm a messy, messy boy, and I needed the behind-the-scenes scoop. So I was like, you know what? I've missed listening to Observer Radio. So I've also been diving back in don't plan on watching wwe anytime soon even though apparently it's uh eric bischoff and paul Heyman pulling yeah. the strings now but i am really excited for fighter fest this weekend the aew pay-per-view yeah um i kind of wish i was able to watch that live i'm actually going to be on a local radio show i saw on Saturday. i saw that <laughs> I'll I'll tell you about it in a bit. Just quickly about Fighter Fest, uh, the latest all elite wrestling show. That actually looks really good. I would love to watch that live. I'll have to settle for watching it uh, the next day. Um, but yeah, that's. I'm glad that there are plenty of alternatives out there between AEW for me, Chikara, and like New Japan Pro Wrestling. There's a lot of wrestling to watch that isn't WWE. So I'm spoiled for choice in that regard. Now, Will, do you know what uh, else there is to watch that's not WWE? What's that? Uh, it's a little animated show I like to call Arthur from the nineties. <laughs> Very true, and that's and that's why you're here. Thank you for bearing with us through the wrestling talk. Um, before it before it completely floats away, uh, <laughs> uh, this is for you know your true Elwood City Limits die hard fans. If you want to tune in, it's going to be Saturday night. 8 p.m. Atlantic time. Now, see, you're already going to have to go into a completely different time zone depending on where you are, like I said, for the that's, super uh, fans. That's, uh, that's, that's going to be 7 p.m. Eastern. I did the math for you all. Easy easy math for all our American friends. That is 7 p.m. Eastern. 7 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Atlantic. <laughs> we, we, on we, CK- we are the only place in the world that uses Atlantic time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, 7 p.m. <laughs> 7 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Atlantic time. Uh, Go to ckdu.ca. I'm going to be on my friend's show. It is called Drag the Waters on the local campus radio station. Uh, Fun fact, I used to have a heavy metal uh, radio show on that same station. This would have been back in 2012 to 2014. Anyway, uh, my friend... Uh, he has a show called Drag the Waters. I'm going to be on it for two hours. We're going to be playing some awesome music, and especially if you're into hard rock and heavy metal. And we're just going to be chatting it up. It's going to be great fun. I'm really looking forward to it. That's uh, ckdu.ca uh, because I doubt you'd be able to get it on terrestrial radio no matter where you are. So that's 7 p.m. Eastern this Saturday, ckdu.ca. Check can it I out. make a request? Can you play that? Uh, uh, can you play Say Anger by Metallica so I can hear that, that drum that sounds like a, a garbage can? <laughs> there will be Ooh. some Metallica. Okay. Well, I guess I, look it's... forward to that. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Lucas, to bring us back here. This is indeed a show about the PBS uh, kids television show, Arthur. And we've got a lot to say about it this week. Um, of course, before we get into it, I'm going to start off hot and heavy with our lovely Patreon backers. That's going to be uh, Caitlin Harrington. It's going to be Chandler LaFave Boten and Christine Wong. A little bit of Christopher I. Phil. Some Crescent Fresh. How about some Dan Mike Dawson Silva? Or Emily K. and Froppy. Sounds good to me. Ian Collis, Jake Bailey, and Joe Sue. The Triple Threat. Uh, John Dulong former guest host of the show, John Griswold and Kaylin Krogall. All right. Kevin Noon, Leanne S., Light Relentless, and Macy Ball, Passion Fruit, Pavlova. We've got Riley Stevens, Ross Ward, Sam Solero, the wonderful Shayna Bennett, Stella, Teresa, and new patron, William. Thank you, everybody. You're, you make the show possible. You're getting your radio practice and your extra salty with uh, sultry. So, excuse me, not salty, sultry with the uh, 
the Patreon sub read this week. Well, and now we're going to take it over to the emails, the ones that you send over at elwoodcitylimits at gmail.com. This is Bob Kingsley for the Country Top 40. <laughs> Wake up, Elwood City fans! It's Lucas and Will in the morning! We're going to get some emails live! Clip in the microphone! It's going to wake your punk ass up, wipe the sleep out your eyes! We got traffic coming up at first. <laughs> the emails. <laughs> That's right. Elwood City Limits at gmail.com. My goodness, we're all over the place tonight. Uh, we got we got an email here from uh, a person who follows us on Instagram, the Arthur Reed feed. Great Instagram profile there. Check him out. Who says, I hate to admit this, but because it's related to the episode that you just watched, I wet the bed until I was 12. And I'm 16. Wow. Okay. Very, uh, very big things popping here. The point is, Jenna's definitely not alone. The Arthur Reed feed here is referring to our last episode, Jenna's Bedtime Blues. I can confirm bedwetting alarms are a real thing because my parents were thinking of getting me one. Needless to say, I think the episode is good for anyone, as Jenna found that she was the only one making a big deal about this aspect of herself, and everyone else was fine with it, which tends to be the case with most insecurities well okay thank you very much for coming forward with that that is uh that's a lot of courage and i'm glad that you got over your problem uh p.s on a different note what were you each excited for from e3 Ooh, i like this question um (laughs) i am excited for uh i mean pokemon pokemon uh, and Death Stranding, even though that was kind of before E3, I'm excited for Death Stranding. Um, I'm excited for the new Call of Duty. Uh, in terms of next year, of course, I'm excited for uh, Animal Crossing. And um, there's actually a bunch of games next year in in March. Uh, the Final Fantasy remake, I'm excited for. Um, and, uh, more, more recently I'm excited for Control from Remedy that's coming out in August, but those are, those are the main mm-hmm. games that I'm looking forward to. Be keeping my, my eye on Control as well. Um, I'm trying to think if there was anything that was particularly, like, really inspiring for me. Uh, oh, oh, I'm sure I'm Banjo and Smash, forgetting. Banjo and Smash, of course. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my wife's very excited about Animal Crossing, so I'm excited for her. Um, do, 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 do. I didn't really, I, I didn't watch it as closely as I did years before just because I didn't have the time off of work. I can't really think of anything. I will mention, though, there is a game that was not, I don't believe it was at E3, but it was around the same time uh, it was announced. It's a Metroidvania game called Blasphemous. It looks really cool. So uh, that's something I'm constantly keeping an eye on. I would also like to say Cyberpunk 2077, but I'm also aware of kind of the... Mm, not so great aspects of its development and kind of the uh, um, the developers' attitudes towards uh, certain members of the LGBTQ community. So I'm a little less excited about it uh, than I think I would like to be. Uh, we also got a nice email and tweet from uh, Red Thunder and Lightning Thirteen. Uh, thank you very much. Just uh, just stay, uh, you know, keep up the good work. Loves the episode titles. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And finally, we have an email here from Pretty Cool Stairs. It's been a while since my last email. Here are some thoughts about your recent episodes. I think season seven is a big shift in Muffy's character. She's still the snobby rich kid, but now that we get to see her more mature and almost business-like side, I think she comes across as more likable. Season seven coincides with a rock and roll special when we see Muffy in her business attire trying to manage the You Stink Band. It seems like the writers stepped up their Muffy game around this time. It was mentioned previously on the podcast that Bailey helps to form this side of her even more so in future episodes. I enjoy the pairing of these two, even though I think it's odd for an eight-year-old to befriend a middle-aged butler. Well, ah, lots of strange things happen on ah, kids' it, show. It, lots of strange friendships. It form. happened to Bruce Wayne, right? So that's true. I, I really uh, should looking for- find Ooh. another pop culture butler besides Alfred, because I feel like I mentioned every time we talk about Bailey, I'm always talking about like I buried it off Wayne's master Bruce. There, there's uh, there's Ducksworth from uh, Ducktales. Okay, okay, we got Ducksworth. We got. Uh, uh, Tim Curry in the movie Clue. Yeah. Uh-huh. Those are, uh, are, those uh, are our pop culture butlers. Yeah, at least off the top of our head. 
looking forward to the to the to this episode's discussion on Buster's Amish mismatch. Uh, I happen to live very near Amish country in Indiana, so I really appreciate what it's done. It's not uncommon to see Amish out in public here, which is probably something not many get to experience. Unfortunately, oftentimes the Amish are portrayed in media as weird and strange, and usually highlights the one the ones who escape to the outside world. Escape in quotes. This episode doesn't do that at all. Instead, it simply shows the way they live and how it's different. Much like the hashtag gay rat wedding, not everyone lives life in the same way, and Arthur does an excellent job of showing that. It's amazing to see this on a kid's show, and again, Arthur pushes itself to limits where no other kid's show will ever go. Literally an Amish farm. Well, we're going to talk about that in detail, I assure you. In general, I love season 7, Elwood City Turns 100 is my top five favorite episodes of the show, along with April 9th, which is another major event in the series. Looking forward to the remainder of the episodes. Science was also my first scary movie as a kid. Yeah. I remember my parents made a huge deal out of it. I think it's funny I wasn't alone in this experience. Was that that was your first scary movie, was I it? I don't know if it was my first scary movie, but I remember talking about how I think everybody around my age, there's a sort of a collective uh, pop culture moment in that we all like remember being like deeply and utterly terrified by the scene in signs where you see the alien for the yeah. first time. Like everybody who was like fairly young in 2004, the first time you saw that movie, you were like, Oh my God, signs is the scariest thing ever. <laughs> it's an effective scene. I'll, uh, I, I felt the same way when I saw it, although I was a, a bit older than you. So it wasn't my first scary movie. Uh, I saw some Arthur fan art online, which got me thinking which characters would get a tattoo and what would they get? I could see Binky getting the stereotypical I heart mom. Buster would get something with an alien or UFO, of course. Who else would get inked? Congrats on surpassing the 100 mark. Uh, I have to continue a sentiment of everyone else. The podcast is always a bright spot of my week and always appreciate what you guys have to say. Here's to 100 more. That's pretty cool stairs. Okay, so Arthur character tattoos. Uh, I could see uh, Buster's getting like some Joe Rogan style sleeves. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, 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 uh I could see, like, the first thing I thought of was Arthur getting one of those book tattoos that you see, like, a lot of Instagram models getting. Oh, very trendy. Uh, I could see yeah. Brain getting, like, a binary tattoo. Yes, yeah. Some typical nerd flair. Uh, maybe, uh, who's the most likely to get, like, a tribal tattoo? Like, a real Batista-looking... I'm going to say Rattles. I'm going to say Rattles. Say rattles? I, I feel like Rattles yes, would have or... cool, like, prison, like... Uh, Vigo Mortensen Eastern Promises tattoo. <laughs> Hopefully without going to prison. but uh, Or maybe the dog kid, the dog tough customer whose name we don't know. Um, I also I also think that uh, I could see DW getting one of those rib tattoos when she's older. Yeah, Fern getting one of those like geometric, you know, a lot of tri- oh, tri- triangles see, for old I, Fern. I could see Fern with also like an Undertaker teardrop. Oh, very, go- very like SoundCloud rapper. Oh, yeah. Uh, Big time goth. Oh, uh, Sue Ellen would probably get like a kanji. Oh, and I bet that um, uh, Prunella would get like some sort of like, you know, star sign, like a, a her, whatever her star sign was, the symbol tattoo. Yeah. What would be the um, the incredibly basic AF lyric or lyric or like saying that Muffy would get tattooed on like her arm? Oh, she would get like some sort of like infinity sign or like you know live laugh love. yeah yeah live laugh love you know i can't think i can't think of any of those like incredibly meaningless sayings off the top of my head but that's what springs to mind for me do you think there's anybody in the cast who like wouldn't get tattoos like just would straight up refuse uh is anybody is oh you know what maybe francine wouldn't because i don't know how I was, devout yeah, I, was kind of I, I don't that. know how devout she is to uh judaism but i do know that uh, you oh, can't get buried yeah. in a traditional Jewish burial ground if you have tattoos. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I was thinking the same thing, although you went a little bit uh, deeper with it uh, than I did. I appreciate that. Okay, everybody, thank you very much for your uh, emails here, elwoodcitylimits at gmail.com. It's time for us to dig into another episode of Arthur. We start off with DW's Time Trouble. And this was indeed the episode I thought it was going to be. It starts with Arthur and DW hurrying to get to the movies. So actually, this ends up being pretty prescient because DW wants to see Doll Story 2. And we're already on to Doll Story 4 here in the real world. Oh, the synchronicity uh, doesn't end there. There's something else that happens in this episode that I'm like, 
uh, too too art imitating life a little too much. Oh, I think I might know what you mean. <laughs> um, but Arthur would rather see Slappy Blackhead's way cool journey through time. Which, which I assume this I is like a like a Bill and Ted sort of. Yes. Once we kind of see the movie, I was like, this is definitely just a takeoff on Bill and Ted. Uh, but just the name itself, I was like, yeah, I don't Yeah, I was know. like, is this like a popper, uh, uh, Dr. Pipple Popper movie? Like, who is Slappy Blackhead? Yeah, it's a weird name. Uh, so they get to the movie theater. DW is like really hurrying them along. Uh, they get there, and Arthur's friends, like Francine and Buster and Muffy, are all going to see Slappy Blackhead. And Arthur has the moment where he's like, the the money's dangling, and he's about to order. <laughs> and he looks over at DW, and she's got the biggest stink guy on her face. This is amazing. I think this, she this even wi- says something. This withering look. She even says something like, please, no, Arthur. Like, she kind of, like, pleads yeah. with him. And, of course, we cut away, and then it goes to all of them in Slappy Blackhead, including DW. By the way, quick note before and, we move on. Uh, 5,000 Explosions and a Supernova is still in theaters. This is like... The Avengers end. Yeah, yeah. Of its they time. brought five thousand explosions of a supernova <laughs> back into theaters in order to beat Avatar's record. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, I love it. Yeah, that's like they they added like fifty new explosions and like uh, like half a supernova uh, the, it, in order to keep it interesting. It, it, at this point, like it must be the most successful film in the Arthur universe because <laughs> it's been years of five thousand explosions and a supernova still. Uh, uh, playing at that theater, Arthur's had three different voice actors <laughs> th- through the through its entire reign. This is amazing. I'm so glad that you noticed that. <laughs> um, yeah, and the, the I feel like I thought this was where the cold open was going to end, but actually it keeps going. And DW hijacks uh, Arthur's narration bit and says, "You know, everybody always talks about how you know having a little sister is." is this and that, but it's actually not so great to have an older brother either. And we get all these examples of like, um, what is it? DW wants a cat, but uh, her parents say no, because they already have a dog, which is, which is funny because it's like, they point is, is like, we already have a dog and one is enough. And it's like this picture of, this is so great. I'm. I gotta take a screen cap of this. It's like Arthur in a framed picture with Pal, and then a picture of DW next to them, glaring at the picture. <laughs> it's really funny. Um, or or like you know, she gets one of Arthur's hand me down jackets, or her preschool teacher Miss Morgan isn't as impressed with her finger painting skills because Arthur was a much more instinctive finger finger painter. This cold open actually went on for like. Nearly three minutes. Actually, over three minutes, excuse me. Um, And just to kind of set up this whole thing of, you know, having an older brother isn't that great. Um, They're talking about the Slappy Blackhead movie after the cold open as they leave. DW kind of has um, maybe not so much logical problems, but like moral problems. She's not sure why she wants to root for Slappy Blackhead because apparently in the movie he like went back in time the whole you know bill and ted thing went back in time so that the dean or something would like fall in garbage yeah this is really like as far as dw is concerned this is like a primer level of complexity in terms of unwinding the uh slappy blackhead plot uh you know looper-esque where the longer you think about it the more it starts to fall apart it's not even that it doesn't even seem like she like the physics of it makes sense. It's more that like why would somebody do something like that? I don't understand it. And they, everybody's like, "Duh, cuz the dean's not cool. He wouldn't let Slappy play his boombox in the cafeteria." And DW's like, "That doesn't mean he should fall in garbage." It's like again, a real kind of moral uh conundrum that she stumbled upon here. It's, 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 you know, she's at the early stages of her intellectual development. It's like when they ask little kids, you know, is it okay to steal medicine, uh, that would save your child's life? And they're all like, no, stealing's wrong. Uh, eventually that, uh, DW will learn that the man sucks and deserves to fall in garbage. Big time. They go back home. It's, uh, mom says that Arthur won't be seeing any movies for a long time because he went back on his promise to take DW to see her movie. And uh, from this point on, this part of the episode is a big old dream because DW falls asleep and Nadine presents her, much like in the Slappy Blackhead movie, 
uh, with a tricycle that can travel through time thanks to radioactive clay. Also a little bit of Back to the Future in there as well. A little bit of Chernobyl as well. DW, stay away from that clay. So their first idea is to go back in time and have Arthur fall in garbage, which is kind of a funny visual as he like plummets from the sky into a dumpster. It's a little bit of, uh, have you, have you seen the, the uh, departed super? Oh, no. <laughs> yes. Oh, I, I totally get that though. <laughs> no, I was thinking of uh super Hummin on Twitter. Oh no. I have don't you know seen this, this guy. Is. No, this is no, it's like this, this guy who's like doing all of these stunts, like these really, uh, on these really dangerous stunts where he's basically just like, li- like literally one of them is like, Drinking a bottle of hot sauce and then throwing himself into a dumpster. Oh, it's it. I like. I of course don't recommend that you try this at home. And he says that too in his videos. But he's like doing front flips onto like light tubes and Lego and stuff like that. It's like just extreme stuff. That sounds like but some content still, right there. Speaking yeah, of speaking I mean, of extreme, he, uh, speaking of extreme, have you seen? Early 1990 shopping malls, late 80s, early 1990 shopping malls, uh, because in DW's dream, when they forego the the garbage plot, we sort of they float on over to this this mall. And before we kind of mm-hmm. realize why they're going there, it just got me thinking about, you know, every once in a while I get in the mood for a heaping helping dose of nostalgia, Will. And I like to type in Micmac yes. Mall commercial into youtube and watch all the old <laughs> yeah. videos of what the micmac ball used to look like uh back mm-hmm. when and it, it, it just makes me think back to you know the far-flung years of 1997 when shopping malls were incredibly gaudy and there was a disney yeah. store in our local micmac ball and all that stuff uh do you ever do you ever do the same are you into the old ball aesthetic because i feel like i don't know if this is just how they animated the mall in this episode, but I feel like they do purposefully make it kind of look like an older mall or just like a more, maybe it's because it's a dream, a more like zany, wacky mall. Every once in a while, I go down a hole on YouTube. I basically subject my wife to like commercials from the 90s, and that often includes like, you know, local commercials for the Halifax Shopping Center or uh, over in our sister city, Dartmouth, uh, Micmac Mall. Um, and I was actually thinking about the Micmac Mall's Disney store. It's like a recently, it, it, like you said, very gaudy. There used to be like a statue of Mickey in the window. Yeah, it was, it was there all was giant palm like, trees. Very, very opulent. There was giant palm trees yeah, in the Micmac Mall. Just very opulent in a way that things really can't afford to be anymore, which is why a lot of stores have left Micmac Mall. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's a very good point. There's a type of aesthetic that you get. I'm sure no matter where you're from, you have kind of like an old, an old mall that used to be, you know, fe- feel kind of grander when you were younger. Uh, DW also notices in, in her dream, in this flashback in her dream, uh, that the, that everybody gets around through horse drawn cars, which I thought was an interesting kind of detail. Her mom uh, is dressed up in like a princess costume. We kind of saw this in uh, the episode where she and dad were like going to a uh, like a catering event and dad was dressed up like a knight and she had like the big princess hat on, whatever you would call that thing. But this time dad Reed is a cowboy with a mustache, which is uh, her way of imagining what they were like when they were younger. So the whole thing here is that they're going back in time to when they got originally Arthur from the baby store, which is apparently this top secret thing where it's like it's normal, you know, it's a a normal baby apparel store, except they have to look around for any kids and then they pull a lever and a bookshelf goes to the other side and there's literally wall to wall giant uh, shelves with babies. Yeah, so this was very like, Terry Gilliam esque, like it reminded me of something yeah. out of Brazil with these like yeah. giant shelves, these these warehouse floor to ceiling shelves, and the, the they say boys and like girls on the side. It's almost mm-hmm. dystopian the way they're all kind of like shelved in these boxes perfectly, and so we're to believe this is where you know babies come from in the Arthur universe, or at least I, uh, DW's conception of where babies come from, and uh, Arthur's parents are talking about how they kind of want a girl, like a nice girl who likes girly things, and the guy's giving them the hard sell on Arthur, who is a 50% off baby. Because he's apparently broken. But uh, but eventually, like 
uh, which which is like he's gassy. He pulls on dad's mustache, and then the sales the salesman just offers them the baby free, along with like a TV and a year supply of ice cream. So Arthur's the ultimate bargain baby and a trampoline. Um, and a trampoline, yes. Um, so yeah, basically because nobody wanted him, and that's how Arthur got picked before DW. Uh, so they go back in time again because they see this all play out and they don't do anything. I'm also, I'm also just going to put this out there. The baby store raises a lot of questions, but I don't think that they're worth asking because this is the dream of a four-year-old. So, you know, I had a, I had a couple things just like, wait, well, how does this work? How does this work? And I'm like, you know what? It's not worth it. So in case anybody's wondering, it's not worth it. It's a dream. <laughs> it's, a, it's a dream and a cartoon. It's fine. Um, so in the second time around, DW... Um, and Nadine disguise themselves in like a giant trench coat, a Vincent Adultman uh, style adult, uh, trench coat as a sales associate and instead directs mom and dad to DW to a baby DW. I'm always a sucker for this gag. It's a gag as old as time. You know, the little rascals, mm. two kids stacked on top of each other to look like an adult in a trench coat right now. Uh, you know, the Mike Gavel presidential campaign is essentially run by two teens uh, pretending to be an old man on Twitter. Uh, there's something about this this whole joke that I'll never get t- I'll never tire of. It's a tale as old as time, that's for sure. Um, so they are all DW leads them over to herself, the, which is like the most popular baby in the store, the best baby you can get. Uh, and so they end up getting DW first. Uh, which ends up being, you know, DW is the apple of their eye. She's this amazing child, uh, all this kind of stuff. You know, she ends up getting a a kitten and a pony, and she's the most instinctive painter ever. Uh, Miss Morgan is at their house at this, like, at this point saying, you know, DW is the most instinctive painter I've ever seen. It's like, have you ever considered having, having another child? And, (laughs) uh... The, the line I have here is, DW is so perfect, there's no point to having another one. <laughs> well, but there's, a, there's actually a lot fa- of, like, mm. this whole baby situation actually brings up a lot of bizarre lines in the episode because DW feels guilty that she left Arthur there because no one will want him. She goes back to the baby store, and Arthur's situation has gotten even d- more dire. He's gone from the 50% yeah. off rack to a storage closet that says keep out on the side. Uh, so they rescue yeah. Arthur from the storage closet, leave it on her parents' doorstep, and uh, Arthur. I, I I just I do want to quickly say there's something I felt really sad when I saw baby Arthur just kind of crying in the. Closet. Is he crying? It, I, I thought he was know. happy. Wait. Let's... Well, he's 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 kind of like whining. He's not like crying, but it's still like. I don't know. Just the image of a forgotten baby that nobody wanted. Oh my god! Yeah, you're right. He is crying. He's got like cobwebs around him. Yeah, my goodness. It's sad. anyway. Uh, and, they they, yes, they go on. even more sad is that DW leaves them on her parents' doorstep and they say, "Oh dear, someone has left us a broken baby." And DW, in all of her magnanimous uh, glory, it, it's it's like she walks into the shot on her pony with her kitten. It's just like he is just like you should. You should adopt him. He looks so sad. And you could get a considerable charity deduction on your taxes. Which is like, that joke is not for any kid. That's so funny. No, and it really is for people like us watching it. And it's also just like, you know, you can't even go on the fact that, like, Arthur's a cute baby. It's like, no, you could also get a kickback from this. So it's not all Arthur's bad. dad literally blows dust off of Arthur as she he takes him into the house. I know. It's, it makes me sad. Uh, okay, so then we flash forward to when DW is apparently the same age as Arthur. She's eight and Arthur's four, um, or so, something to that effect. Um, can I just say? Can uh, I just say? Point, fit check yes. on baby Arthur real quick. The uh, the, the oh the yeah mint, the mint polo with the overalls. Woo wee! That's a look. That's that's that would you could rock that at any Urban Outfitters today. And nobody would bat an eyelash. Looking at him right now, he does have a little bit of a Lucas Mancini vibe to him, a little bit. <laughs> it's also because I, 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 I he also has the same vibe as me because I'm baby. Will I don't know if you know this or not. I'm baby. You're baby. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's it, he's also he's also got a little bit of a tood. He's got a bit of a '90s tood about him, which I think also fits as well. Also, uh, the the Reed household. I, and again, I'd be remiss if I didn't just at least give some lip service to the animal hierarchy because they're really rubbing it in our faces at this point. Because <laughs> there's also a pig and add, a monkey added to the TV the tropes Reed page. household at this point. 
Yeah. It's it's a practically a menagerie. I think there's a monkey in there too. Uh as DW is kind of indoctrinating Arthur into thinking, you know, unicorns are good, bionic bunny is bad, and uh, you know, feeding him cookies uh to keep to keep him in line. They also they they then they cut to a rally for Mary Moo Cow for president. Which, you know, uh, well, at this point with twenty four Democratic candidates, uh, you know, the first half debated last night the next half is going tonight uh you know with with people of the uh, the notoriety as like hickenlooper and uh maryam williamson and and uh, uh uh amy klobuchar why not mary Mukow? you know what i mean like why if, if we're gonna have 24 candidates we might as well make it 25 uh and and give mary Mukow a shot yeah, absolutely. Um, it's certainly not out of the realm of possibility since we're, you know, tampering in the domain of time here. And it is a dream. I mean, uh, it, so will, Arth- would it be any more ridiculous than Beto O'Rourke, who in the 90s was in a hacker group with <laughs> the uh, pseudonym Psychedelic Warlord, or also was almost in the band at the drive-in before he went to boarding school? He was the bass player with the guy who started at the drive-in. Uh, uh, I, Mary Bukow, you know, went up against that. It doesn't even seem that unrealistic. Yeah, I mean, we're we're already pretty close to that Black Mirror episode <laughs> where that uh, where that animated character runs for parliament. So you never know. Uh, Arthur has a has a temper tantrum here because he's uh, holding up the sign for Mary Bukow, and DW still kind of plying him with cookies, but he, you know. DW runs out of cookies. He accidentally throws his glasses and then, uh, uh, like just off of his head completely as he's flailing. And then he goes back to, Oh my God. I love this. Uh, Arthur goes back to the parents is like, DW broke my glasses. And <laughs> this is the return of one of my favorite things. Uh, uh, Bruce Dinsmore does with dad. It's his dad's baby voice. Oh, I don't know if I caught this. Oh, I oh man, I wish I could remember the line, but it's you know like they immediately go like D W, <laughs> like they immediately believe Arthur. It's like he he just he just goes like oh D W, take him to the movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so funny every time that it's and it's also like a signifier of like we're definitely in a dream because Dad doesn't talk like a baby normally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. All, I, all I that's know. all it, that it's missing is like in in the dream sequences when Arthur's mom acts really mean when she's like, oh, yes. do, "Do you remember when like Arthur's mom was like, DW is a baby, like 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 Kate is a baby.' Yeah, yeah, Kate is a baby. Besides, we like her better than you. <laughs> like, yes, like which? Yes, yeah. It's it's like yes. That's that's a great comparison. It's like when mom is really mean and dad is acting like a baby, then you know it's kind of like a DW type fantasy. Um, so then they say, you know, DW, take him to the movies and buy Arthur new glasses on the way, which is a chunk of change out of DW's pocket. Glasses are not. Yeah. I was going to say, I hope DW has her parents insurance information on hand. So they are able to, you know, um, get the, the insurance credit for the, the, uh, the bifocals, the, uh, uh, prescription, Mm. you know, it's like 250 bucks. So. Uh, so they they're going they're on their way to the movies. Uh, I, I should have mentioned in the be- in the cold open, Arthur takes grown up Arthur takes them through uh, a shortcut, which leads them to the back of the movie theater. DW tries to take them on the same shortcut, but she doesn't know it, so they just get her they just get lost, and Arthur starts to you know have a little bit of an another bit of a tantrum. I don't know if it's because uh, it. the dreamlike nature of this episode thus far, but as they get lost in this shortcut and they're sort of wandering next to this brick wall, for some reason my mind, and I feel like I've this is like the eighth time I've brought this up on this show here, but my mind drifted off to Mulholland Drive when they walk behind that wall and see that like witch creature. Uh, I was like half expecting there's a, like a weird ominous tension to like DW and Arthur wandering behind this wall and like the br- bush is kind of shaking up like it's a creature from Mahala Drive gonna jump out here <laughs> yeah I, I have this dream <laughs> <laughs> he was standing right where you're standing that's that scene like even if I'm watching it in broad daylight and I know what's coming still scary and I can't figure it out why 
It's like it, it just freaks me out every time. I think it's just the the sound and the suddenness of the movement. It's got that's got to be it. Like it's just ooh, it's <laughs> chilling. It's 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 a way to start a movie. That's for sure. Uh, so DW and uh, or I should say, DW and Nadine try to help their uh, D- older DW kind of get through but then Arthur accidentally finds a time cycle and goes somewhere in time I don't know so both DW versions meet up with each other thankfully they don't touch so they don't time cop themselves and we also get to see uh age aged up Nadine here as well yeah this is a I real her design uh I mean I'll I'll give you this one for free will this is a real like uh uh Arthur, uh, not Arthur, uh, Spider-Man pointing to himself-esque meme seeing young DW and Kate uh, face off against old DW and Kate. I feel like there's ripe meme potential Nadine. here. Like, uh, when they're all crying and freaking out, it's like my inner child and my current adult all, like, having anxiety at the same time. I'm sure there's, like, relatable memes that can be done with this imagery. I wish we got uh, older Kate. I'd love to see older Kate. You said uh, Kate instead of Nadine. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, so they just end up basically all yelling for help, and DW kind of st- starts crying and you know wishes that things were back to the way they were, and that's when she wakes up from her dream. And I think we've said this before in previous episodes that it's just nice. I think it's nice when Arthur and DW are nice to each other because it is pretty rare. Uh, so Arthur comes in to check on her. She gives her, like, a Mary Moo cow and a crazy bus to help her fall asleep. And DW is very thankful that Arthur is back in her life the way that he normally is. And this is where the episode ends. DW goes into Arthur's room and kind of cuddles up next to him to fall asleep. To which I was like, man, Arthur didn't really earn back DW's love. It just happened to be that she had a bad dream and got scared. And so now they're kind of, they're kind of square, even though Arthur... Did, did wrong by her yeah awful convenient for dw but i suppose it, you know sometimes it'd be that way and now a word from us kids and now a word from us kids this one kind of felt like a bit of a throwback because there was i, I guess just because it was very straightforward we've had a little bit of twists in the uh way that a word from us kids is presented lately and this is very much just like no, they're just kids. They're talking about their families. They're talking about like they're they're making pictures of their brothers, sisters, and cousins, and that's kind of it. They're the animators are like animating their drawings, and yeah, it's kind of what you see is what you get. Uh, I will say, I yeah, I I, I was just gonna say I love like you know throwback to. I feel like we used to have a lot of these word from us kids where the animators animate the kids drawings. It's always kind of fun and kitschy. Um, and I also, uh, like the little girl who said, sometimes me and my sister, uh, speak a little French. Uh, my favorite was the little girl who had the 23 year old sister. So quite the age gap there, but I just thought she was really cute. She's just like, I sometimes go for walks with my sister. I'm really lucky. And I'm like, Oh, she's adorable. But that's, yeah, that's about it. Before we get into, uh, well, a little bit of an Amish situation, let's uh, hear from us again. And now a word from me, Lucas Mancini of Elwood City Limits. Don't forget to chat with your Elwood City Limits pals on social media with facebook.com slash Elwood City Limits or at ECL Podcast on Twitter. We also have a Tumblr, elwoodcitylimits.tumblr.com and an Instagram, at Elwood City Limits. If you want to send us a question, send us an email and get it read on the show at elwoodcitylimits at gmail.com. You can find the entire episode archive at elwoodcitylimits.libsyn.com or on your favorite podcast service. If we aren't on your preferred podcast app, let us know, and we'll do our best to get on it. Thanks, as always, for supporting us here at Elwood City Limits. Now... Back to the show. And now, back to Arthur. Uh, Buster's Amish mismatch. This is, uh, you kind of have to slow down when you say it. It's a little bit of a tongue twister. Um, this cold open is uh, very much uh, a lot shorter than the first one because it's literally the kids going on a field trip 
somewhere, and Buster always tends to take things back from him, back from wherever they go. There's actually a reference here to Buster's Dino Dilemma from Season 1. Yeah, I love it when they flex the continuity like this. Buster's Dino Dilemma is literally like the second episode of the show, isn't it? It's within the first five, I think. I think I want to say it was like our third episode. I just, I remember, whenever I think of like me and you in the old radio station, like just starting out this show back when we didn't know if we were going to keep doing it and all that stuff. I feel like I always think of Buster's Dido Dilemma. That's one mm. of the like standout episodes of that season. Yeah, me too. Uh, th- that was like the first, I think, big laugh that I had on that show was you saying Dino Crime, which is why oh, I named yes. it. Which is what I named that episode. So go back to uh, like episode, I think it was like two or three. It's called Dino Crime. It's I, I'd say it's a really good episode. So yeah, uh, wonder what Buster's going to bring back with him this time. Like one time he brought back a, pol- uh, a badge from the police station by accident. We also see Buster tucking into a barrel of fudge at like a confectioner's, which I don't know, made me pretty hungry. Uh, I will also say what also made me hungry is as they're going through like the kind of farm country nearby Elwood city uh, Buster sees like a wheat thresher and he imagines it to, he imagines it to be this, you know, fantastic machine that can like chase after UFOs and also like makes loaves of bread. And we see Buster in the driver's seat. He is about to hoe into an entire bread loaf. We also get and this, like, I- it's like a, 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 a life of Brian sort of, quick like really quick usually the cutaways at arthur they kind of indulge in them a little bit longer but this is literally like three seconds of like buster flying up into the sky there's aliens that it oh it's over yeah <laughs> um so they're actually heading to elwood city's amish country and uh this is how where i first learned about the amish when i was young believe it or not it was either because this we... it was this or weird al Mm. Oh, right. Amish paradise. I think I heard that later Uh, because I don't believe there's any Amish or Mennonite communities that are around us. I've seen them at farmers markets and stuff, but I'm not sure if they're they're traveling from elsewhere. I could be wrong about that, but it's not like, you know, we don't live in Pennsylvania. No. And there's like Amish right down the street. Practically. I mean, I know that's not true. We might as well address this up top because I don't know how much you know about the Amish will, but something I was wondering that is certainly not addressed in this Arthur episode is that don't the Amish have like one year when they grow up and they get to like be a part of modern society and do whatever they want and then so, they get to decide if they want to go back to being Amish or if they like live in the modern world for the rest of their life? So pretty cool stairs kind of alluded to this a little bit, I think. And he, he mentioned a, or they mentioned a lot of um, a lot of narrative about Amish and popular media is about Rumspringa, which is their like what you said, as I'm to understand, it's their opportunity to go experience the real world and decide if they want to continue living the Amish way of life or live like we, like you and I do. Uh, I can't say I know too much about it. I know there was a reality show based around Rumspringa. There was also uh, Amish Mafia, which is one of the most infamously fake reality shows of all time. <laughs> uh, I also know that there is a uh, somewhat locally filmed uh, drama show called, I think it's called Pure, which is uh, a dramatic take on the Amish Mafia. So they get to Amish country, and a lot of this is just like straight up education about Amish people and it was actually good to be reminded of you know uh, <laughs> what they said <laughs> I, I, I'm, I really don't want to take them out of well I don't want to take them out of context but then again how's any Amish person going to find out <laughs> if we take them out of context <laughs> hey Amish people you listening you contributing to our iTunes score <laughs> I didn't think so Damn, say whatever I want. Damn, Will's really coming for the Amish here. (laughs) I will say this. I was surprised to find out that Amish people don't play instruments. Oh, yeah, they don't don't believe in playing music. Yeah, I kind of found that strange. I figured that they would be all about that since, you know, you got to make your own entertainment somehow besides the joy of physical labor again well this is really i'm really showing my ignorance with this episode but i i I don't know like sometimes uh very you know uh uh, some old uh uh very devout religions you know sort of don't believe in music i know that um there's uh super super uh almost like extreme sects of islam perhaps don't uh Mm. uh uh, like non-secular music and i i know 
I think there's even like extreme forms of like Christianity that don't like music. So maybe, you know, Amish or Mennonites are, are, are kind of like that. But again, I'm kind of speaking from a place of ignorance here and just kind of making assumptions. Yeah. For sure. I wouldn't I wouldn't purport to know exactly why, but it, it just kind of seemed a little strange to me. Uh, Buster makes friends with an Amish boy named Daniel and he gets to try some homemade apple butter, which sounds good to me. Yeah, I've never had apple butter. I do not know what it would taste like. Me neither. It seems like two really disparate elements, but man, I'd like to try some. Mm, it's like butterbeer in Harry Potter, where it's like two disparate elements, <laughs> but when you hear the words together, you're like, I don't know what that would taste like, but I bet it's yeah. good. Yeah, it sounds pretty good. Very savory. Uh, so it turns out that they're right on time for a barn raising, which the kids get to help with, and they get to have some of their... Uh, uh, they're di- uh, they get to invited to dinner as well. Uh, Buster with horrible table manners here. He has some more apple butter on his bread, and then he just like drinks it right off the spoon. You double dipped the apple butter. That's like putting your whole mouth in the apple butter. Well, maybe that's what initially uh, kind of makes Mr. Rapper mad because Mr. Rapper seems to be ticked off with Buster this entire trip. Like, there's a Very part on where edge. there's a part where uh, Buster's like churning the butter, and he's like, "Look at me, I'm churning butter!" And like, Mr. Rapper seems like super mad at him for no for no real reason. He's being educational. He's like excited to learn. And Mr. Rapper's like, "All right, Buster," like he's like sick of him churning the butter. Yeah, he's he's uh he must be a bit on edge. I don't know. Uh, maybe didn't get enough sleep that night. Um, so they they build this barn. Uh, Buster, something really clicked in him, and part of it is that it's. I, I liked that Buster discovered the satisfaction of a job well done. He's just he says this is the first time I've ever built something with my own two hands, and he's really enamored with the Amish way of life. And Daniel gives him his. Uh, his like stove, not not it's not a stovepipe hat, but his like Amish hat. So, Buster is on the way back home, committing to living the Amish lifestyle, which Brain is very much insistent, and Brain kind of the know it all again in this episode that um, he insistent that Buster can't live the Amish lifestyle um, in in modern society and it's not even that like the kids aren't even all on their phones like Muffy's talking her cell phone but Arthur's playing like a game gear and other people are like on their electronic stuff this is before smartphones Buster (laughs) uh, Buster tends to take things a little bit uh, extreme so the jacket he's wearing he finds that he can't wear it anymore because it has buttons so he gives it up to which I was like, Buster, your polo shirt also has buttons too, so I don't know. Like, <laughs> obviously, he doesn't want to go shirtless, but, you know, like, you know, fair's, fair's fair here, pal. Uh, doesn't ride in the car with Bitsy on the way home. He walks, and, yeah, he's going to be taking this uh, to the extreme, it seems. Uh, they he Yeah, so Buster walking with Bitsy is just, the way they animated it, He's really got a like that picture of John Lennon where John Lennon's kind of like walking really crazy with like the super wide stance. He's got one of that one of those going on. It's almost like if Bitsy wasn't if you were able to erase Bitsy from the car, it's like he's ghost riding the whip the way he's walking <laughs> next to this slow moving car, uh, especially with his Amish hat on. It's quite a sight to behold. That's that's really funny. I'd, that'd be cool if somebody like just Photoshop Bitsy out of that. And he's goes riding the whip. Um, so Buster has this like you know complicated dinner thing of just like how about you make some you know boiled cornmeal from scratch or whatever. And Bitsy instead instead orders pizza. We get a scene here at dinner where Buster again is insisting on his Amish way of life. It's interesting. We don't really see Buster getting to act like a kid all that much. He's usually like you know, kind of the general co- uh, comedic foil. But he really does act well, like a kid Well, here. maybe it's because he acts like a kid. It's just that he acts like us, and it's like we don't want to be <laughs> – we don't want to be seen as acting like kids because we act like how Buster <laughs> acts all the time. No, but uh, you're right. He is being a little bit – I don't know. Is, like, impotent the word? Uh, like, insolent? Uh, uh, he, Ins- insolent. Yeah, not, Definitely uh, insolent, not, not yeah, impotent. Not impotent. Uh, I don't know about the Amish communities. Again, I don't have the health statistics there. 
But oh my God. I, uh, uh, mm-hmm. uh, he's acting insolent in that he sort of is making these demands of Bitsy without really asking her opinion about, you know, we can't turn the lights on, we gotta do all this stuff, she can't use the phone, and he's almost panicked about it. He's like, no, we, we, it violates our Amish way of life, and Bitsy uh, is, I, I mean, given the circumstances, is kind of handling it pretty well, but... Uh, we get some great lines from Buster. Buster's like keeps he keeps repeating his mantra of those people really know how to live. Uh, yeah. And then uh, you know Bitsy's like, well, could you be Amish by yourself in your room? And Buster's like, you're making me go it alone. Um, but eventually it it, it, just, it just keeps getting worse and worse for Buster because his room is cold because they have electric heat. Um, and you know Bits- he has to use the hand crank flashlight. Exactly. And and you know. Uh, <laughs> also, earlier in the episode, Buster did say, I'm through with all that modern junk, which is a great line. Uh, mm-hmm. And he's also, you know, he's demanding his mom, it's not the Amish way. Uh, and Bitsy's sort of trying to plead with him and be like, well, you know, Buster, is it okay to be... A little Amish? Uh, just a little bit Amish. You know, you could do some things that we do, and Buster's not having it. Uh, Buster says, is Bionic Bunny just a little bionic? Which I will say, uh, you know what, Buster? He actually is, because he's part bunny. That is, yeah. He, he, he's not just bionic. He's bionic bunny. Yeah. So he's got, he's got two masters to serve. <laughs> you know, Superman isn't, he, he is an alien, but he's not all He's alien. super, you know, th- but he is also a man. Yeah. So spurious logic, but Buster can't be talked out of this. Uh, He even gets his own like Amish getup that we see for the rest of the show, which I thought it was kind of cool. Like he's got this jacket that he has to tie together with a rope and he's got his black hat and like black pants. I don't know. It kind of looked cool. Uh, Well, you know, we have our uh, right now we're in the throngs of the uh, uh, 90s revival in fashion. Maybe we're... Um, oh God, now I got a re- what is this? Is it, is this six, 1600s revival? What? No, seven. What? Okay. What, what, are you ta- what, are you what, about? what time are the Amish emulating? Will? Oh God, I'm really, this might be the stupidest I've ever come off in any episode. I feel like I've just been making incorrect claims left and right. Uh, what? Well, then stu- well, then stupid me up. Cause I don't know either. When does the movie, the witch take place? What are the pilgrims from? <laughs> The witch. Oh, duh. The witch. Jeez. Settlers, colonialism, eighteen something. Yeah. Let's see. Six, six. Let's. This is this is my this is my historical references. When did the witch take place? Ba 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 ba. Sixteen thirties, New England. <laughs> okay, sixteen hundreds. Sixteen hundreds. Let's leave it at that. Uh, I think I guessed sixteen hundreds. Did I? You did. You did. Yay! You, but you. But you weren't you weren't super confident about no. it. No, so. I was like, okay, eighteen hundreds. That's cowboys. So, <laughs> uh, no, cowboys is eighteen hundreds. That's what I said. I know that that's because... what I said eighteen hundreds. Yeah, because like Red Dead. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was thinking Back to the Future Part Three. But yes, we all have I, our. Well, I feel like we need to read more books. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, ain't that the truth? <laughs> oh, I need to get out more. I need to learn more. I need to do more with my life. Oh, anyway, back to the Arthur podcast. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, Buster, Buster is trying to emulate the 1600s way of the Amish, but he's having a rough go of it. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that he kind of he realizes that at least he thinks he can't do because he's trying to be Amish. So he tries to like, sew something for himself. He gets all these bandages on his fingers. Uh, he can't accept uh, lunch at school because it was made from an electric oven. His brain points out, which is like, all right, brain trying to starve him or what? Um, he walks home in the rain uh, because he thinks he can't take uh, the car ride. And it, 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 he's just essentially making himself miserable. Like he's trying to study by the hand cranked flashlight, but it's just making his arm tired. Uh, and he tries to churn his own butter in, in like the corner of his room, but he thinks he just made mayonnaise and Bitsy with the, with the greatest threat ever is just like, that's it. You're sleeping with the heat on tonight, young man. So yeah, Buster then has a dream 
where he imagines the a similar scenario to the beginning of the episode where he you know goes on that intergalactic wheat thresher and chases the UFOs. He imagines the UFOs coming to him in Amish country, but the only thing that he has is a, basically a donkey with a yoke, and the donkey is far too old and not, well, uh, airborne enough to chase after the UFOs, so he misses his chance. So he he and at this point he's like getting a cold as well. Like he and at school the next day he's just like Mr. Ratbird watching TV is against my beliefs. <laughs> Very stuffed up. Um, and we actually get a little bit of Miss of Mrs. McGrady wisdom here. Feels like a long time since we've had her kind of step up to say something. Uh, and she mentioned she says to Buster offers him some hot food. And says that whatever you think you're doing, it isn't Amish because Amish people, you know, they don't drive cars, but they can ride in them and they can accept, uh, you know, food from anybody. And like it's it, like they can accept things that were made, you know, on electric things, ovens and what have you. It's kind of uh, as if a Buster's appropriating Amish culture without truly really understanding it. Mm, good point. Uh, very. Uh, very pressing for today's times. Uh, and, you know, Mrs. McGrady essentially saying that, like, you know, when you went to Amish country, did everybody look cold and tired and miserable? And Buster's like, no, they actually looked really happy. So he realizes that he's been kind of doing it a bit wrong. So he renounces the Amish lifestyle, but then decides he wants to do one more Amish thing, which is to do a miniature version of a barn, of a barn raising. They make a... Uh, they make a doghouse for Pal, which I, I did. Pal have a doghouse before? I feel like he did. Seems, did he? Okay. I was gonna say it seems weird that he hasn't had a doghouse before, but maybe he did. Maybe I completely missed it. And also, I yeah. uh, uh, you know, I forgot to say this when they were uh, building the barn earlier. Second time I'm mentioning Red Dead this episode, but it reminded me of the barn building montage from Red Dead Two, and and that song that plays. There's like a, a barn building. Oh, yes, it's yes. Like, it's, it's like literally, it's like a very literal act like, building a barn. <laughs> yes, I know the song you're talking about. My my friend who's really into Red Dead 2 uh, kept talking about it. Uh, but I, I've i heard it before. I just can't, like, I can't think of it in, in my head. Uh, but yeah, that's a great point. So they so they do this little um, doghouse raising, and then they eat some pizza, which uh, Bitsy made the dough for herself from scratch. And I thought this was a cute moment, the way to end it off. Buster saves the dough, and he says, and he says it's the first dough made by Baxter hands. So taking a little bit of the pride in worksmanship that he learned from the Amish. All right, so that about does it for again another pair of episodes with unusual premises that you might not see elsewhere. Uh, Lucas, what did you make of DW's Time Trouble? So, DW's Time Trouble, I might go as far as to say DW's Time Trouble is the weirdest episode of Arthur I've ever seen. Really? Like, the weirdest, you think? Yeah, I just, like, like, whatever the time stuff gets involved, between the, the Terry Gilliam halls of babies and then sort of the climax of the episode where uh, DW is meeting her older self uh, creatures are like changing in the trees and, and the radioactive Play-Doh. I don't know. And I don't know if it's cause I'm overtired from work and the, the technical difficulties, but I had a real hard time making heads or tails of DW's time trouble. And this isn't me overplaying. I know people like to be like, Oh, the time travel stuff was so confusing. It's not that it's just the, the whole thing was a little bizarre. That being said, I think the episode does have a pretty genuine heart to it in that, you know, we're always seeing Arthur's perspective of being annoyed about having a baby sister. And it was kind of interesting to see uh, an episode from DW's perspective where you could actually kind of see her point of view, where it's hard to be second and always being compared to someone else. Um, I was reminded of a story from my little sister, not so much in elementary school, but when she was in high school, teachers would always kind of ask her about like, oh, are you little are you Lucas's sister? Um, and that's sort of what I thought of when we got the segment where the teacher's asking her about the painting. And it's like, oh, it's not like Arthur's painting. Of course, that situation's a little bit more exaggerated and probably wouldn't happen. But I, I, I kind of liked the heart of this episode. I just thought it was a little bit 
uh, a little bit out there besides that. And, and usually I like out there, but for some reason I wrestled with it tonight. Um, You know, it's funny. I didn't even consider how I felt about this one as an episode. I appreciate that it is strange and it's out there and, you know, kind of futzes with, you know, what you would expect from an Arthur episode. There's a lot of in here that I think you can get away with because not just because it's a cartoon, it's an Arthur episode. It's also like it's a dream and it's a dream of a four year old. So they kind of get the chance to do some really funny visual gags and like just creative stuff and i also kind of liked the dynamic of older dw younger arthur which you're not really able to do normally i just kind of wish that they i kind of hope that they do it again honestly i would love to i'd love to see more of that um if this was like an anime so, you could have a whole series in that alt timeline yeah. where dw is older and what happened to like little arthur after he took the time cycle like where did he go yeah, that's will that's a great question uh i mean i thought i thought it was good i thought it was good i you know it's i don't think it's gonna necessarily stick in my memory for too long but i had fun with it i think it's um you know a little bit of a frivolous episode i think it kind of tied up a bit too neatly at the end but you know it's all in good fun so i gotta i gotta kind of give it a little bit of a thumbs up there uh, I also did find myself liking Buster's Amish mis mismatch, and I think Pretty Cool Stairs made a very good point in their email about that it does not really make a punchline out of the Amish. In fact, if anything, Buster's the punchline here because he kind of takes the wrong message away from what he admires about the Amish. Um, it treats them with dignity, and it represents them pretty well, I mean, I guess as far as I know about the Amish, which is admittedly, as you said, not very much. And I did kind of like the the story of a character taking something that they like a bit too far, which as ki which as kids are prone to do, they tend to take things to extremes, and I and it's it's just not normally that they get enamored with the Amish. So this was a, an interesting opportunity to talk about that, and I thought um, this yeah this was just kind of an interesting direction to take for Buster at this point, and. Uh, yeah, I, f I found myself quite enjoying this. Uh, I, um, I'm i not sure how I felt about Buster's Amish mishmash. On one hand, I think it's a great introduction for kids to Amish culture, but I also think that with stuff like this, it can be difficult. You know, like you and I have both kind of stated, uh, neither of us are technically like experts in sort of how well this uh, portrays or accurately uh, shows Amish life. We're kind of taking it at face value. And I think that is both a strength and a weakness of the episode in that, you know, a lot of what we know about the Amish is probably from the, this episode of Arthur and that it introduced us to that culture. But on the other hand, it's like, um, it's, it's sort of difficult to sum up such a historied group in a 20 minute episode of a kid's show. So I wonder how much of this episode is, you know, sort of filled with cliches, um, but I also think that that's kind of the point of the episode because Buster has a very similar experience that we do in that he only has kind of a brief visit and he sort of takes all of that stuff at face value uh, without learning any more and sort of tries to copy it all. And that ends up being the moral of the episode is that, you know, I mean, maybe you didn't really understand uh, Amish culture uh, as much as you thought you did, Buster. You were only kind of doing a face value uh, uh, reading of it. So in that way, I think it succeeds. Um, and like you said, I do kind of like seeing Buster in this strange situation where he's sort of demanding everyone uh, uh, or specifically demanding a Bitsy you know, be Amish with him. And she's kind of great parenting moments from Bitsy. You know, I, I remember back to how annoyed we were by Bitsy in the, in the early couple seasons and to see her here in this season, really dealing with Buster's, uh, uh, uh obsession with the Amish in a really constructive way. I think, uh, uh, in a way where she's sort of not making fun of him and trying to respect his wishes, but also looking up for his best interests. But yeah, I don't know. I, I I think there's some great lines in this episode. You know, I'm through with all that modern junk. Uh, but again, similarly to uh, the the previous episode, uh, DW's time trouble. I'm just not quite sure what to make of it. I I think I'm also reeling from. I I think season seven's been pretty strong thus far in the t two episodes we've gotten thus far. Uh, and so these are a little bit more middle of the road compared to those. 
Interesting. Okay. Uh, well, there you have it. It's uh, like you, like you said, we kind of keep racking them up, season seven episodes, and they're definitely not uh, they're not playing it safe. That's for sure. Which I uh, which I appreciate. We're kind of going through new and uncharted waters, and we're gonna keep doing that. As we move forward, before we end off here, I just want to give a quick shout out to who, whichever tropers are editing the Elwood City Limits TV tropes page. Uh, we've got we've got a few more tropes on there, and I really appreciate that. I had to stifle like a an excited giggle uh, as we were recording here as I was reading it. Uh, very cool. Uh, my wife even gets a mention on there, so <laughs> I guess all three of us made it to TV tropes. I'll have to tell her about that. Very dope. That's very cool. All right. So, Lucas, you've been very good at, uh, to meet with me this late. So I'm going to let us go here and let you know that next time on Elwood City Limits, we're going to be talking about the world of tomorrow and is there a doctor in the house? Oh, d- 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 very exciting stuff. Yes, the world of tomorrow, I definitely remember. Uh, we got a we got us a binky episode incoming. Now the other one I'm not sure about. I'm ready to be surprised. So until we get to that new episode, uh, hey, d- uh, don't forget to nominate us for the Coast.ca Best of Halifax Awards. But you heard that up at the uh, beginning of the show. And uh, check me out uh, this uh, this well this is probably going up on Saturday. So if you're around Saturday night, 7 p.m. Eastern, CKDU.ca. Check me out on Drag the Waters. It'll be fun. And if not, we will catch you here next time on Elwood City Limits. My name's Will Young, and for Lucas Mancini, there's a country called Amish. We'll see you next time. Uh, I'll also say you know you got a Twitter plug. Will follow me on Twitter as well at Lucas underscore Mancini. I have a locked Twitter account. Uh, but I'll, 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 I'll give you that. I'll allow that follow.